America needs its freedom. Time to reopen. Plus, YouTube is censoring those doctors from California who broke with the consensus over the lockdown. From a right to be believed to a right to be heard, Democrats changing the rules over the allegations against Joe Biden. Plus, should businesses be liable for COVID risks to employees? Are we heading for a meat shortage and Pence mask gate? That and more coming up. As our nation battles against this terrible scourge, we continue to pray for the victims as well as for those Americans who are grieving their lost ones and their loved ones. There's never been anything like this. We suffer with one heart, but we will prevail. We're coming back, and we're coming back strong. We built the greatest economy anywhere in the world two months ago, and we're going to build it again. We're going to build it fast. It's going to go very quickly. And Larry, thank you for being here very much. Uh, it's uh, you see what's going to happen. I think you have the same feeling as I do. It's going to come back very fast. I certainly hope the president's right. Welcome to the Buck Sexton show, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, man, it is it is time. It is time for us to finally say it. We need to reopen this country and this needs to be happening faster than it currently is. I know that there's all this guidance. I know that there is a is a desire to make this go slowly and safely and the time is now different paces for different places new york should be a little bit slower should be quite a bit slower than some states and uh, and somewhat slower than others but we can't continue doing this this has been a bit uh, absurd now for a while in my opinion there are states where you have like texas has 30 million people about 29 million people and 600 deaths. The state's been shut down for going on two months now. What are we doing? What the heck is this? Now, I know Texas is starting to open up and other states are beginning this process. Uh, You have a partial reopening already in Montana, Minnesota, Colorado, Oklahoma, Colorado, 93.7 FM, Denver, what's up? Uh, But Colorado opening up. Uh, partially Tennessee, Oklahoma, Georgia, which got a lot of attention from the media trying to scare Georgia's Governor Kemp away from a reopening. South Carolina, Mississippi, they're all opening up or have already begun that process. A lot of states, uh, a lot of other states have orders expiring tomorrow, April 30th. Uh, for, with that, you've got Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, Texas, Alabama, Florida. And they are in the process then of also opening. But then you get into what are, oh, and and Maine also, by the way, will be opening up. Then you get into a whole bunch of other states that are shut down or restricted with no immediate end in sight. All of the Northeast, uh, all the, really what we consider the East Coast before you get down to South Carolina. So from North Carolina all the way up to New Hampshire, locked down. Our entire West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, locked down. The Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, the Midwest, the industrial Midwest, Ohio, Michigan, locked down. How long are they going to continue to do this? Nobody really knows at this point because they're also putting in place rules and regulations that are going to make it very difficult for them to have real progress without setbacks. And this is what I think everyone needs to know beforehand. This, this needs to be established early in this process. If we start opening states and then go back to full on lockdown in those states, it's going to be disastrous. How do you prepare an economy for that? How do you prepare people psychologically for that? No, we've we've done the lockdown thing. We, we get it. We know the mitigation measures. We understand that there's not a, a, a cure for this disease and that the treatments for it are substandard right now. They're not sufficient. They're not good enough. Although I did see, and we'll talk about the good data today for remdesivir from Gilead, uh, Gilead Pharmaceuticals. Hopefully, all we have to do is, is have something that would make the mortality rate for those who are hospitalized, which is a small percentage of people who overall even get the disease. If we bring that mortality rate for the hospitalized down by 50, 60, 70 percent, then this becomes an entirely manageable health problem right now it's more of a challenge and much more of a of a threat 
because of the mortality of those who are over 70 going to the hospital. Imagine if we can get to the place where you're over 75, you're in the hospital with COVID, and they have something that means you know you got a 9 out of 10 shot of making it out of that hospital. It would be a game changer, right? I don't, I don't want to get our hopes up because who knows how far away this will be. But some good data from Gilead Pharmaceuticals on remdesivir. Uh, Colchicine is also going to have some data coming out soon. This is I've been hearing about this from doctor friends in New York for a few weeks now. Uh, there's a big study out of Montreal, and they're hoping that colchicine will prevent a uh, will pre- prevent the inflammatory response in the lungs. That's what ends up killing people. ARDS, uh, which is part of the or which comes during the cyto or is tied in with the cytokine storm. Gosh, reading about all this health stuff, I got to tell you, who, who would have thought? It's it's like we're all living in one long web md article these days but we got to open the states we have to do this it needs to it needs to be a mentality that we share the data is not supportive of the lockdowns anymore if you really look at it it's not supportive of the lockdowns there are mitigation measures that should be kept in place there are certain things that we're going to have to be doing for a while but the overall lockdown approach is just not what we should be doing and that's why uh I understand states are reopening and we're moving ahead. But I'm saying we need to move this faster. This needs to go faster than it has so far. People need to go. We keep saying go back to work. We need to get back to living our lives. We need to get back to having the basic freedom in our day to day of where we're going to go and who we're going to see. That's a part of life, too. You know, we're all in, in what is effectively this this true mass mass incarceration. You often hear liberals talk about mass incarceration as a political issue, but we have been in a mass incarceration. Yeah, sure, you can go out for essentials, but, you know, if you're under house arrest under some circumstances, I mean, official criminal house arrest, you can still go to the hospital. You still have some, you can go to doctor's appointments. There are things they let you do. So, yeah, okay, we can maybe go out for a walk. If you wear a mask, it's it's gotten, uh, it's gotten to the point where we just have to say enough is enough, And, and we're there. I think you've all been there for a while. I'm here in New York. I've been building to this point, but none of this like, oh, maybe this is going to drag on for 18 months. Maybe we're going to have to lock down again in a month or we're going to lock down again in September. No, that's wrong. We shouldn't do that. The data doesn't support it. It's not saving lives the way they claimed it would when you line it up against places that did not do lockdowns. This is looking increasingly like a an overreaction, a panic move that the administration and states were pushed into uh, for a combination of the, the media frenzy around this issue after being completely wrong and downplaying it when, it when when the media's panic would have been perhaps helpful. They were telling us it was no big deal that this wasn't going to this wasn't going to hit us that hard. And then. When we all realized that it was going to actually hit this country very hard and cause a lot of a lot of mass death and casualties, then the media's response was locked down for as long as it takes everywhere. And if you're opposed to that, you're a bad person. You want to sacrifice old people to die. That's what they say. It's nonsense. It's it's just wrong. But this is now a major, a major fight we have on our hands because there are places that want to do whatever they can to drag this out as long as they can. And the politicians who are in charge, you must remember this. Politicians will always disappoint you. They're not as good as they pretend to be, and they're not as good as a lot of people want to believe they are. Government is inept by its nature. That's why our founders wanted a very limited and clearly delineated series of authorities and powers for the government. That's why the focus wasn't on how do we have super geniuses in charge that can make all of our decisions for us. That's socialism, that's statism. No, the focus was here are the things you're allowed to do and here are the rights that individuals have that the state cannot trespass upon. Oh, there's been a lot of trespassing on those rights, though, hasn't there? There's been a lot of that going on and not nearly enough pushback on it. Elon Musk, who, whether you love Tesla or not, is certainly a a dynamic and brilliant fellow. He tweeted out uh, earlier... Well, it was, I guess, late last night. Uh, free America now in all caps. I, I share the sentiment. It's time to free up this country. We can figure this out as we go along. We can take necessary steps to protect people in high-risk groups and in high-risk areas without shutting down the whole country. This was a mistake. 
the across the board lockdown was the wrong decision. I understand why Trump felt tremendous pressure. I understand why different states and governors even felt a pressure to do this lockdown. Some states, maybe, and really it's just New York, New Jersey, Michigan. Some states you could have justified this for two to four weeks. But we've gone, we've gone past it. it. It has reached its expiration date. And all of this focus on, oh, we need the testing and the testing will be in place. And without that, no, we have to start living life again. We have to accept this. I'm going to be somebody who's out in the red zone in New York City. I will be go- I'm already going to stores and outside and interacting with people. But I'm somebody who's going to be living in the highest risk part of the country. But I'm a relatively low risk by age individual. And I'm willing to take the risk. And I know that that means there's going to have to be some other procedures in place for those of us who do have people in our lives who are at higher risk. And I understand that this might mean that some people have to continue on a regimen of uh, extraordinary caution for the weeks and months ahead. But we're more likely to have an economy that can beat the virus. We're more likely to be able to sustain frontline medical personnel, pay them, keep them in status at the hospital where they're actually doing things to help people and help people who don't have COVID-19, by the way, if those of us who are at lower risk are productive and engaged. You know, we have to remember at some point, what exactly are we fighting for? I'm not fighting for the I'm not fighting for a future of being safe at home and, and having a, a fridge full of food. And we'll talk about the possible meat shortage later. No, we want we want the liberty to pick what our future will be. And that means the right to make individual decisions that entail some degree of risk. There's been a fundamental shift away from this that's happened in our society where you have this this panicism or safetyism, as Heather McDonald uh, called it in her article this week. And we do not live lives of safetyism. We live lives of balanced and assessed risk of all different kinds and in many different ways. Free America now, Elon says. I'm with him. It's time. I got to tell you, I am absolutely loving Jack Carr's newest novel, Savage Son. This is the latest in the Terminal List series, and I'm just ripping through this book. It is fantastic. It is pulse-pounding action that takes you right into the heart of it. And you know because of Jack's background as a former Navy SEAL who saw a lot of combat himself that there's a lot of true to life, the facts, the figures, everything that you would want from a true action novel, you've got in here with real expertise brought to you by an incredibly skilled storyteller. Jack Carr's Savage Son is my favorite so far in the Terminal List series. You got to check it out for yourself. Download the audiobook wherever you listen to audiobooks. It's so straightforward. Just go to your audiobook platform of choice. You can do it on Amazon, a whole bunch of places, and type in Savage Son. Download that audiobook today. It's read by Ray Porter. It's going to be a fantastic way for you to spend some time when we're all on lockdown. Go check out Savage Son. Download the audiobook by Jack Carr today. Now, I can understand that there's a tendency to think others, especially those who are in charge, especially those who do not share a a similar philosophical foundation about government, the state, individual rights as you and I do. You would think that they are also seeing the situation with clear eyes. Full hearts can't lose that they're seeing this in a way that that all of us can start from a, a premise that we hold some things in common about what's going on and what should be done in this country. Unfortunately, we are now in for quite a struggle because there are a number of different factors coming together. There is a mass panic, a mass hysteria over this where it's very hard to penetrate this with facts and data. There is a enormous political motive, which we're not supposed to talk about. And the political motive, of course, is to make sure that the economy, the economy can suffer and suffer and suffer, which is going to hurt Trump's reelection chances. We all know that. And the people that are pushing for a more suffering economy are going to say we were saving lives. So they get to feel self-righteous about it, too. And, and then you have the state's People forgot this, but states, once they have a taste of certain powers, the people in charge think that they should continue to wield those powers. They do not want to give them back. They do not say, yeah, that was fun, but 
or that was necessary, but we're going to move on to something else. And that's what we're facing now. We're facing that recognition and realization. And also that there are private sector businesses that are willing to go along with efforts to suppress dissent, to shut down the discussion that all of us should be having about what's an intelligent response given where we are right now. I mean, there's the focus on what has happened, and we do some of that here, but I'm most concerned on how quickly can we get things back up and running. Remember, the economic damage here is time delayed. We're not going to really understand how many businesses are not going to reopen, how much the debt that we're accruing is going to drag on our economy and future growth, and, and also the, the changes in daily life and the way that they're going to affect, even once we start to reopen, how they're going to affect different industries and businesses that are out there and what that means for people. There's going to be a, a, an enormous shift um, of workers, of wealth, of time allocation, of careers, and that can be a painful process. In the end, maybe you get to a better place through that kind of economic evolution, but in the short term, it means a lot of people without a check. It means a lot of people who are going to be going through a painful time. And we're just starting to really get a sense of how broad that is and what that's really going to look like for months, if not perhaps a year or two ahead of us. You know, if this were so easy, if it were possible to just have the government write checks to keep an economy going, why shouldn't we just give ourselves a, an eight-week paid vacation every year, courtesy of Uncle Sam? There's, there would be no good reason unless there were negative consequences to that for all of us. And we understand that there are negative consequences, but no one has been focused on that. No, we've been told, stay home, you'll get money, you'll get paid, and we'll send you cash. Just make sure you got plenty of you know, mac and cheese and soda in the fridge and whatever else, and everything's going to be fine. People want to go back to work. People are tired of this. And the data does not support this continued across-the-board shutdown. I have to keep repeating that just because we have to get this through into people's heads. Yes, this disease is dangerous, particularly dangerous to a certain percentage of the population. Yes, it has been a horrible death toll so far. We were not prepared for this. And it's a stunning, it's a stunning failure of government to have been able to handle this better fine all true but now now i want to see more and more states adopting the policies of individual freedom and economic choice that we should all have as part of our, our day-to-day -day lives i mean new york they're talking about this might you know we got a 12-step program and we got to have this amount of tracing for this amount of individuals, they're never going to be able to test and trace. Give me a break. They're never going to be able to do this. They've never been able to do this for a disease at this scale and this speed of spread. And, and we think that now we're going to figure this out. And you're going to, I mean, New York is doing this. We're going to pin our hopes for returning to some degree of, of not just normalcy, some, some degree of, of a life that we get up and look forward to with things to do with the ability to go out there and make a difference and make choices, we're going to pin that on government setting up a test and trace program that is well beyond not just their capabilities now, but no, no one really thinks they're going to be able to do this. Think of the resources involved and for what? So that we have a better idea of where there are infections in the country than we would based on people who currently know that they're infected based on the symptoms and then go and get a test. We're going to try to track all asymptomatic carriers I, mean, I, I, keep, I keep hearing that that's the plan, and then I look around and I say, that can't really be the plan, is it? But no, it is for them. It is. And it's very political, too, because if you go against test and trace, if you go too fast, guess what? It's all Trump's fault. That's what they're going to say, because the federal government should be doing it. This is a time when it's particularly important that we have open and free dialogue, debate, discussion about what's happening in the country because it affects all of us. Nobody is immune from this. No one is unaffected by it. It is something that we are all very much dragged into in the middle of and has a really negative impact on us. 
the shutdown across the nation, the shutdown of our states, of our businesses, of, of the economy. Uh, this has this has affected everyone that I know. This has affected me and my business, too. This is not a good time, a fun time to be in particularly media that doesn't have, you know, a legacy corporate uh, entity that owns it. Right. I mean, you know, we're, I'm not doing a radio show for uh, a, a company that is you know, owned by Disney or, you know, it's it's not one of these massive conglomerates. Uh, along the lines of what you have at the cable, at some of the big cable news networks. So everyone's affected by this. I mean, everyone is being uh, just because of ad revenue, the lack of demand and everything. And that's that's just on the economic side, on the psychological side, on the health side. And I might have a chance to talk to you about what we're seeing early stage of this, what we're seeing based on the data in Oregon, uh, mortality data in Oregon and what that is telling us. It's not what you would think right now based on a lot of the narrative around COVID-19. But we should be hearing from experts. And one thing that has been consistent is that we were told for weeks, do your part to help the frontline medical workers stay home, shut up, wear a mask. We don't want to hear it. Do your part. That's what that was really the message. I mean, maybe they were a little more gentle with it than that, but that's more or less what it boiled down to. If you want to help us, if you want to help the medical workers, you absolutely have to not be out and trying to be living other parts of your life. You have to stay home. Okay. Well, now we've got doctors who are coming forward who are saying increasingly, no, I don't want to do that. This doctor at St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx, which has been hit very badly. Uh, Those of you who are familiar with New York City know know the Bronx pretty well. Uh, It's an area that has had a really high uh, for hospitalizations, uh, a, a large number of hospitalizations, but also the mortality rate has been high. And minority, the minority community in the Bronx, the Bronx is a very large minority community in general. They've been hit particularly badly by this. And it's just, it's been brutal. It's been terrible. A doctor who's a frontline ER doc in Barnabas Hospital is like, look, here's what's really going on. He wrote this in the New York Post over the weekend. He says, there's, there's some terrible stuff happening here, but it is only really affecting the population that we had thought all along was at highest risk. And we're doing the best we can for that population. But the disease had already spread wide uh, before broadly before uh, we had this lockdown in place. And this doctor who is he's dealing with covid patients all day long, trying to save lives, trying to protect people. And he's saying that to most of the population, the risk is very low and the economic and health impacts, health impacts of the lockdown are disastrous. And with each day get worse and worse and worse. There, there is no antibody to a bad economy. There is no, okay, we're just going to wait this out for a bad economy, right? That's not possible. So that's where you start to have these doctors who are coming out, and they're very brave because they're really speaking against a, a medical community consensus. And look, I'm just going to say it. Most, uh, most doctors in certain fields, are uh, they tend to be Democrats, Surgeons tend to lean Republican, which I think is very interesting. Uh, There are some fields where you have a higher percentage of surgeons, heart surgeons, brain surgeons tend to be Republican. Uh, Psychiatrists, mostly libs, huge majority of psychiatrists are liberals. Uh, But there is a a hashtag science consensus that had settled in. Now, when I say it's a consensus, that's a perception. It's not a reality. It doesn't mean that every doc agrees with this. And certainly some of the docs that I've been talking to probably because some of them are social acquaintances of mine as well. But here in New York, we're dealing with COVID. They haven't agreed with the across the board lockdown policy. I mean, some of them were like I've said, they're like two weeks, maybe because we could have shut down for two weeks. It would have been okay. It would have been painful for businesses, but that we could have bounced back from that. That would have been very manageable. A month, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks. It's not manageable. It's not uh, not something that's worth the cost. But you have this. So there are doctors that are coming out and and they're saying that they're the ones that are seeing the worst of COVID-19 every day. They're the ones that are seeing the Wuhan coronavirus destroying, uh, you know, certain communities here in New York. Not really doing very much to a lot of states with much less population density, but destroying people here in New York City and destroying families. And and the loss of life is, is terrible. And they're saying we still have to go on and we still have to go forward with life. We can't continue the lockdown. You're hearing doctors saying this now. That's a big change. That's the big switch. And then you have this 
situation with doctors from Accelerated Urgent Care out in Bakersfield, California. Doctors Dan Erickson and Artin Masihi. And they just did a, a sit down, a, a conference really with 23 ABC. So credit to 23 ABC for, for putting this together. And, and the, the video went mega viral millions and millions and millions of views and they and here's here's why the video uh went mega viral in that way because they said things like this cases that we already know about so if we look at california these numbers are from yesterday we have 33,865 covid cases out of a total of 280,900 total tested that's 12 percent of californians were positive for covid so we don't, the initial, as you guys know, the initial models were, were woefully inaccurate. They predicted millions of cases of death, not of, not of prevalence or incidence, but death. That is not materializing. Whoa, hold on a second. You're, you're, you're not allowed to say that. It's true. But Dr. Dr. Uh, whatever his name is here, I forgot for a second. I think it's Dr. Erickson. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Erickson. Not allowed to say that. Not allowed to point out what we already know to be the case, which is the models were way off. Oh, but he goes further than that. What is materializing in the state of California is 12 percent positives. Well, if we we have thirty nine point five million people, if we just take a basic calculation and extrapolate that out, that equates to about four point seven million cases throughout the state of California, which means this thing is widespread. That's the good news. We've seen 1,227 deaths in the state of California with a possible uh, incidence or prevalence of 4.7 million. That means you have a 0.03 chance of dying from COVID-19 in the state of California. 0.03 chance of dying from COVID in the state of California. Is that, does that necessitate sheltering in place? Does that necessitate shutting down medical systems? Does that necessitate people being out of work? Does it? Does anybody want to try to answer that? Does anybody have any interest in what these doctors are saying? Well, the answer we know is that, of course, millions of people, millions of people wanted to hear what these doctors had to say. And they're they're treating this, this is the data that they have collected and they are frontline medical docs doing everything that they can everything possible to to save lives and to help people and this one doc dr erickson is saying look you have a very in state of california you have a very 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 small chance of dying from this this state of california is on lockdown like it's new york why it shouldn't be this doesn't make any sense it's not a good idea the data doesn't support it now you'd think that this would be very important for people to be able to hear, to see for themselves. You should watch this whole video. It's about uh, about 45, 50 minutes long. He just goes through all the data, tells you what he thinks. You should be in a position where you can make your own determinations about what their recommendations are and what they're thinking about all of this. But you know what happened? It got pulled down. YouTube decided that this was a violation of its terms of service. I think I mentioned this on the show yesterday, and I know Tucker Carlson talked about this a bit last night on his show. Why would YouTube pull this down? These are two medical doctors talking about data and talking about what they are seeing, what they're up to, uh, you know, meaning that what, what they're seeing from the actual process of trying to save patients' lives and do everything they can for them, and YouTube pulls it down? How how could that be? It, it seems so completely bizarre. Um, and here's what YouTube said. Quote, we quickly remove flagged content that violate our community guidelines, including content that explicitly disputes the efficacy of local healthy authority recommended guidance or health authority. It says healthy health authority recommended guidance on social distancing that may lead others to act against that guidance. Uh, so now science, which is all about testing and retesting hypotheses and assumptions and data, 
they're, they're, this is remember the the global warming consensus. I mean, this is how the left, the libs like to think about these issues. There is a way that you're allowed to talk about it. There's a way you're allowed to think about it. And if you deviate from that, if you even ask questions about it, you're a problem. Do as you're told, peasant. Not allowed to ask any questions. YouTube is going along with this. How could anyone think that this violates community guidelines? You know what violates community guidelines? State governors acting like petty tyrants telling you that you have to stay inside. Police using sting operations to determine whether or not someone is offering their services as a as a nail salon uh, person to people behind closed doors to paint their nails and whatever people do at a nail salon. I don't even know. But that that to me is a violation, isn't it? Arresting somebody in front of his or her children be, for being in a public playground when there's basically no risk. We're going to start to say this. There's basically no risk from being in public in the open air if you maintain even a, a, a basic, normal human distance from people. You know, usually you don't walk out, go to the park, and start nuzzling strangers. So as long as you just maintain some personal boundaries, your risk is effectively zero. That's what the science says. Meanwhile, we got idiots running all over the place telling us you got to be masked in public all the time. No, that doesn't make sense. This is now superstition. This is turned into some kind of uh, you know, public sanctimony competition about who gets to be, you know, who is the most dedicated to fighting against COVID-19 by wearing the mask the most. This is absurd. It's stupid. But we're not allowed to talk about it. We're, we're supposed to, the, the largest video sharing platform in the world, YouTube, is going to shut that down. Now, fortunately, it's up in a whole lot of other places, and it's just made the video, as so often happens with censorship, it makes the video even more enticing. People want to see it even more now they realize that it was at least temporarily forbidden to them. But I sit here and I just can't help but think about how this is playing out and everything that we've thought about the status, everything that we've thought about the left, we're being reminded of it now. They want power. They like to wield power. They don't care about your individual rights. And there is this, this mentality among the establishment political and media class that science is something that you just say and it's a slogan and you can bludgeon other people into submission by saying science, you know, even if you're completely ignorant of even the most basic tenets of science. And that's what's happening right now. They have no explanations for why the models were so off. Remember, the models were used to tell us all to, sh to shelter in place, go home, be on lockdown. And that's what this is. This is a shelter in place order from states across the country. The models were the main justification for that. We were not told, look, we might lose 60,000 to 70,000 people over the next six or seven months, but we might also be able to bring that number down a bit if we just do the following things. No, no, we were told, stay home. You're going to lose 100, 250,000 people, even if you do everything we say. So you better do everything we say because it could be much, much worse than that. My friends, they were wrong. And bending the curve has now turned into, or flattening the curve, has now turned into, well, we're going to kind of just keep trying to do this for as long as possible. Because really what ends up happening is you just spread the spread of the disease out over a longer period of time, which means that you're going toward what is a de facto herd immunity strategy with mitigation to slow the spread, but not to stop it. That's what we're heading for. They won't be honest about it, though. So instead, what they say is, well, we might do. And but there are some who are claiming that we're really just going to have to do a series of lockdowns, additional lockdowns. It's time to free America. It's time for all of us to be free. People want to stay home. They can stay home. You don't want to open your business. Don't open your business. You think you're at high risk. Take whatever precautions you any American needs to know that, that you, the American people as individuals are responsible for your own health. No one else cares about it as much as you do. You might have loved ones who care a whole heck of a lot, but no one cares about your health as much as you do as an individual, as a person. You need to be empowered to make decisions for it. You need to have the best data, the best information possible, which is hard when you've got suppression efforts from YouTube and others. But it's time to restore the balance of freedom in this country, including the risks that come from allowing people to make their own decisions about their lives.
my mind, it's inevitable that we will have a return of the virus, or maybe it never even went away. When it does, how we handle it will determine our fate. It's coming back, he says. Wait, we're flattening the curve, right? We're flattening the curve. Okay, it's been flattened. Now what? Now we either start to try to live life again, or we just hide until and hide and pray for a vaccine or a cure while the economy and our society crumbles around us. Those are the options. Some of us knew this in the beginning and tried to tell everybody. I tried, and I will tell you, even I, once I saw those models, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, okay, don't listen to the authorities. Two million people will die unless we do what they say. I, I didn't know that the models were going to be as far off as they were. I thought, I, I always bake into my analysis, or build into my analysis. I don't know what baking is on my mind. I always build on my analysis the possibility of government ineptitude and stupidity. I didn't think it would be off by so much. But initially, I said, look, we got to go back to work. I understand that there are risks. I understand that there could be additional spread of the virus, but we, we've got to go back to work. We, we can't do this. It doesn't make sense. And now everyone's saying, wait a second, maybe, maybe protecting vulnerable populations, taking basic mitigation measures, engaging in some social distancing. I also want to see how much the social distancing really makes a difference versus the natural spread of the virus over the, the progression of this. Remember, it's been in the country, it has been in the country since January, February, and it was in March when we had this, this huge spike in, in deaths and, and mortality. Um, or sorry, it was in March when we all realized, rather, that we were going to have that huge spike in deaths and mortality. And then the worst of the virus hit late March, early April. I mean, it, it was spreading very rapidly. It, spread to, it had spread to millions of people in this country already. And then they're telling us, oh, but because of these mitigation measures, I, I'm sure the mitigation measures help. Uh, I'm sure the common sense aspects of it do have an impact. How much? How much of it is just don't be around sick people, self-quarantine if you can, and wash your hands a lot? That's what I want to know. I want to know what the answers are here. 